Welcome to The Authority File, the academic library podcast from Choice. Choice is a publishing division of the ACRL and the publisher of Choice Reviews and CC Advisor. This episode is brought to you by Credo. I'm Bill Mickey, the host of the podcast and the editorial director at Choice. And for this four episode series, my guests and I will be discussing how orientation and engagement factor into the first year experience. These discussions are part of a longer series on the first year experience that Credo is presenting with Choice. Last month, we looked at some of the other components that make a successful first year experience program, namely collaboration and information literacy. But then for the next couple episodes, I'll be joined by Ray Pan, a doctoral student in educational leadership at California State University, Fresno, Andrew Carlos, STEM and web services librarian at Cal State East Bay, and Danielle Rapu, library systems and assessment librarian at Pasadena City College. In this third episode of our series, our guests offer insights and takeaways from their day-to-day -day development of first-year experience programming, particularly in serving diverse student bodies. Okay, so Ray, you've had the opportunity to work with um, a bunch of really interesting, insightful, um, and gifted folks on the Credo FYE guide. Um, and I'm wondering, in talking with all of these folks, if you've had to um, boil it down to two or three key takeaways, I'm wondering what you might think those would be. Yeah, so the FYE guide is uh, uh, open access, so anyone can download it. It's uh, really great information covering a variety of topics from assessment, instruction, orientation, collaboration. And the one I'm, I'm particularly really interested in and in sharing with all of you is the uh, chapter two, uh, chapter three, or, or actually chapter two, excuse me, on collaboration. And it looks at specifically um, from Dickinson College, uh, Chris Bombero, who is the uh, uh, associate director of research and instruction. Uh, she shares this opportunity on how to um, really build relationships um, to introduce FYE information literacy on campus. So. I think uh, it's important to think about your stakeholders, so your faculty, your student affairs folks, and have them and un have them understand that there are a variety of assignments that they can consider in embedding in um, information literacy in their assignments. So, also working with um, administrators to optimize these instruction because it you know it, it takes a, a, a village to really get this going, and utilizing the library space to hold events and opportunities, right, uh, to, to build these collaborations. So what uh, this emphasizes is really teaching the teachers. So because we all know this, a lot of FYE librarians tend to be the go-to person, and they get you know overwhelmed at times because there's a lot of students, a lot, a lot of need, a lot of demand. But if you work closely with the faculty, um, such as including the writing center and other um, special programs, you can actually build a scaffolding uh, um, program to sustain and scale it. So um, teaching the teachers uh, is one way that uh, Chris mentions in a way to um, uh, introduce the pedagogy uh, that the library can support um, by um, helping faculty understand these different tools and research materials out there. And I, I know it seems kind of like intuitive, you would think, but a lot of times we, we forget because we just sort of assume the faculty would know. Actually, um, they, they, they probably only have experiences, if they're new faculty, usually teaching the first year programs, first year classes, they may be only exposed and be familiar with their own library experiences wherever they got their um, graduate degrees or training. Right. Yeah, but well said, that's excellent. Um, and then what about you, Danielle and Andrew? Um, thinking about uh, first year experience, I mean, what takeaways would you offer from um, your own programs and experience? What are some of the characteristics of uh, FYA programming that are unique to your institution's environment um, and student population versus those that are perhaps more universal or or common to all institutions. And Danielle, why don't we start with you? Sure, um, I think that recognizing that even when you have maybe a limited budget that there are things that you can do that don't require a big budget, such as taking the time to meet with their regular FYE uh, instructor and talking to them about uh, reiterating some of the things that they get from the library sessions, such as you know when they struggle with their research or they need help with it, that they should come to the library and to really echo the things that we teach because oftentimes we do get to see them, but um, we don't always get to connect with them at their point of need and 
very often they are in the classroom with uh, their FYE instructor um, throughout the semester, and that will be their more familiar point of contact who can uh, support uh, the student by letting them know what's available in the library. And aside from meeting with faculty and telling them to reiterate some of the things that are said in the instruction sessions is libraries can host uh, the work of the FYE students. Um, so we have hosted the posters that our students uh, complete and uh, display them in the library uh, for view throughout the semester as a way for the students to see what previous students had done. So throughout the semester, while the student is in the program, uh, they are able to come to the library and see examples of these posters. And it's a good way to illustrate what the culminating goal is for the course with the group collaboration poster. And by hosting it in the library and um, the instructors directing their students to come to the library to see the examples, I think it's a great way to um, encourage the students to um, really demonstrate the um, ability to be creative with their research because the posters oftentimes take an artistic creative element and students really get a chance to see it illustrated in front of them when it's on display. Okay. Um, and Andrew, how about you? Uh, so as Daniel and Ray pointed out, working with the faculty in the first year students is actually really beneficial. Um, I had the opportunity a few years ago to work closely with the folks who are teaching the general studies, the FYE class, and it's actually worked out really well for me because it was the engineering students who I, I also liaised with, so I got to see them in their first year, and then later on when they were taking their disciplinary classes, I got to see them again and I got to build a really good relationship with them. Like They remembered me from that one session that I did for their um, general studies class, so they already felt comfortable to ask which was really nice. Um, uh, our institution, our FYE program, is very much controlled by our general education department. So it's really hard for us to like develop programming to reach out to them, mainly because they're, they're like block enrolled in things and they are so overloaded with all the activities that they have to do right. that it's like, what's another thing for them to have to worry about? So it'll be kind of nice once we do move to semesters and we no longer have our first year class to really worry about because I think it's giving us an opportunity to figure out ways to engage with students that isn't related to a class. So we could do, like, we could be present at their orientations, we could be present in their classes, we could support them through, like, presentations and poster sessions and stuff that they do. Mm -hmm. um, and we've actually started this new thing where um, our first year students, when they come to the library, they come there to get their student AV photos to be so usually there's like a giant line of like a hundred or so students just like sitting there milling about like kind of lost, not sure what's going on. So we've actually had um, our librarians showing up, we have snacks, we have games, we have things for them to do to really engage with the library. And our goal is really just for them to see that librarians are there to help support them and to like be a resource for them and really just put like a friendly face to the library. So that maybe when they come back in, when they have a research question, they'll see someone that they recognize in line and they're going to be more willing to ask us for help. Okay. I, just, I just wanted to add something, uh, what uh, Andrew had mentioned about relationships with faculty. I think one of the uh, burning challenges that I, I've noticed uh, in, from my own experience as well is that every semester you have these new faculty uh, who happen to be, whether they're graduate assistants or visiting professors or adjuncts or lecturers, and they teach the FYE program and you know, the classes, first year writing, the communication studies, et cetera, and they change every semester. Like it's not consistent. So you really have to like keep building relationships over and over um, in that sense of working with new folks coming in each year. And it, it can be it could be very challenging, but it can also be very refreshing to work with new folks. They might have ideas, but at, at some point, you know, it, it really is uh, something to think about. How do you sustain it uh, consistently with Faculty who are not necessarily, um, you know, tenured professors, but are rather, you know, in temporary roles um, supporting FYE. Okay. Yeah, and, and also if they're like adjunct faculty, they're not always available in on campus. So sometimes they're like driving around to multiple campuses, so they don't always have time to like sit down and talk to us. 
is there anything you can point to, Andrew, that 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 works in those in those um, situations, particularly with the adjunct faculty? So our campus tries to do the thing where they would actually give us a little bit of a stipend if we were all to get together and just maybe really, like figure out a way to. I think we have uh, three or four classes as a posture that the students take, and yeah. they actually wanted to stipend us and like give us opportunities over the summer to develop a cohesive uh, curriculum that covers all four of our classes. And it's been very difficult because our faculty are all over the place. They're not always yeah. the And really, like our, our the either the graduate students or the adjunct faculty who teach for share experience are so overloaded because they have to piece together um, work. But even though they really want to be collaborative. So it's, it's we're still trying to figure out how to make that happen. And I think the library is a good place for that because a lot of them view the library in a really like positive light. So they're mm-hmm. willing to collaborate with us. We just need to figure out how to not make it be more of a burden for them to figure out that sort of curriculum. Are your first year students great researchers? Let's be honest, the answer is probably no. Websites like Google and Wikipedia have spoiled users with convenience while flooding the information landscape with sources ranging from shoddy to outright duplicitous. Credo Online Reference Service can help. Its user-friendly interface gives students the convenience they expect paired with the authoritative content librarians demand. Features like topic pages, the mind map, and real-time reference make it ideal for demoing the research process during instruction. Visit corp.credoreference.com for more details and to download the interactive Credo FYE guide, Practices for Enhancing Instruction, which features prominent librarians offering step-by-step activity plans and best practices. Um, one of the things we've talked about with you before, Ray, um, I think in a previous uh, guest spot on this podcast, is the way individual students bring a particular set of constraints and opportunities to the library with them. Um, I remember you talking about Hmong students at Fresno and the specific cultural background that informs how they think about the library. Um, you know, as someone who may have limited time with individual students, how can you incorporate that sort of thinking into um, even limited duration interactions, um, or, or should you even? Um, should librarians go through the day constantly trying to put themselves in someone else's shoes? Um, but at the end of the day, I wonder um, if sort of that exercise and empathy is, is essential to this whole process. Oh yeah, I certainly think that it's important for everyone to develop a sense of empathy, uh, especially if you're serving students with all different backgrounds, because they're you know, we all need to recognize that they all have different um, needs, and I think you know it, it's it's something that uh, it requires uh, a level of um, obviously uh, patience, but also uh, understanding and curiosity of finding creative solutions to address these um, concerns that students may have. So uh, I'll give you like an, another example. I was the liaison to our Dream Success Center, which is for supporting undocumented students on campus, and it, it's a, a, a special program under student affairs. And I work closely with the coordinator. We've had several meetings together, and we've uh, talked about workshops. We've, we've um, I've created a research guide for them, including uh, scholarships and so forth. But you know, I've also met with some of the students who are um, uh, undocumented, and this is obviously um, a really, really uh, difficult time uh, for everyone, particularly mm-hmm. if you have that status. And I think that makes me more aware of what are their challenges. So uh, you know, one of things I learned from them is that they've never used the library before. This is their first library. And then I asked them if they've ever been to a public library. They said, oh, no, I, I don't think I can use it because I'm not, you know, uh, I don't have the status, you know. And I said, no, 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 you actually, you can use a public library. Um, and did you know there's one that's closer to you than the one here on campus where you have to fight for parking and, you know, yeah. find a seat and so forth. I mean, it's right. bigger, but, you know, it's still challenging. And so they didn't know. And what one of the things I did was um, bringing in the public library folks to help register cards public library cards, specifically for those students who are being supported by the Dream Success Center. And this was one idea to get the students to feel comfortable, a sense of um, you know, comfort in, in the community that they're in, um, aside from just the campus, and knowing that you know we have all these resources, and aside from scholarships, that we have these connections. So I think uh, um, you know it, it's, it's, it's challenging right, to, to really think about um, empathy and, and understanding the different perspectives. But you know, a lot of times, as instruction librarians, 
we like to teach students to think critically and think about these different perspectives and how do they make these um, arguments and see different perspectives in their papers. But I think for like an exercise like this, it's uh, something that requires a lot of um, um, collaboration and really thinking uh, thoughtfully what would what would support your colleagues who are really um, directly um, involved with student services like the Dream Success Center? Right. Yeah. No, that's an excellent example, Ray. I mean, I mean, imagine on one side you're you're sort of um, having to um, you know build a, a fairly homogenous kind of programming experience in order to attract as many of the students you can, um, but at the same time you've got this sort of inherent dynamic where you're you're also having to accommodate or, or um, be empathetic toward a variety of backgrounds that students are coming into the school with and um, sort of building that into the, the programming as, as well um, and Danielle I'm wondering if you might um, have any other thoughts on this yourself yeah I mean I would just echo the se similar sentiments on the the topic I uh, you know, I feel like even though we are different institutions, a lot of the same things apply to us. We have the same challenges and we yeah. um, definitely use the same tools and um, use the same strategies to overcome them. Okay. And Andrew? Um, yeah, so I, I think it's really important for us to really develop our empathy towards other students. Like, I know as, as a first-gen student myself, like my experience, feels completely different from other first-gen students' experiences. So I've, I've, I've been first trying to like connect with other students and just see like what their experiences are like and just kind of see like where I can fit in and supporting their, basically their like career paths right now. So right. It's, been, it's, been, it's been a lot of work for me to like just start developing empathy. Um, and it's been, it's been, it's been really cool to be honest too, because I've developed really good relationships with that was Ray Pun, Andrew Carlos, and Danielle Rapu. This concludes the third of our four-part series on how orientation and engagement factor into the first-year experience. This episode was brought to you by Credo. Be sure to join us next week for our final episode of this series when we talk about library anxiety where it comes from, and how our guests specifically help their students overcome it, and how librarians can attract members of the library community in addition to undergrad students. Yeah, so one of the things that we run a lot are gaming events. Yeah. We've actually seen that it's expanded a little bit. It's not just students who are showing up. We've actually had faculty and some faculty and involved their children to our events. We've also had some staff show up. So it's been really nice because it's it's given us the opportunity to show that the library is not just a place for them to get research help, but it's also a place for them to start building connections and community with each other. Find all of the episodes of The Authority File on your favorite podcast app or on our website, choice360.org. Just click on the librarianship dropdown. On choice360.org, you'll also find information on Choice's entire product platform, including Choice Reviews, CC Advisor, Choice Webinars, resources for college libraries, or white papers, and a whole lot more. A great way to keep up with the Authority File is to join the Choice Authority File Facebook group, which you can access via the Choice Reviews Facebook page. As a member of the group, you can give us feedback, suggest podcast participants, chat with other listeners, and submit new topic ideas. That's all for this week. Thanks for joining us.